Okay, so apologies for the interruption. Uh, let's get back into damping. Um, I'm just gonna kind of repeat what I previously said, except I'll talk about it more from the perspective of resonance. So with resonance, uh, we have a sound wave traveling through an object like a tube. It bounces, comes back, and we reinforce it. We keep pushing the kid on the swing, right? Uh, and if we keep pushing the kid on the swing at the right frequency and keep reinforcing that pattern of motion, we get what is called a standing wave in um, our resonator. Uh, and normally we think about this in terms of like a closed tube because that's kind of close enough to uh, what we do when we voice things in speech uh, to be meaningful to us. But in this case, we have a loudspeaker at this end. We push a pulse of air down the length of the tube. It bounces, comes back, and then we push it again. Uh, and then the other thing that happens here, which is interesting, is that we get this pattern of alternating high and low pressure. Um, so after we push this pulse of air down the length of the tube, uh, we get a rarefaction uh, right behind it, uh, which is also gonna travel the length of the tube, kind of uh, counterbalancing the um, pressure peak, uh, which we're trying to reinforce. Uh, so at any one spot, or at particular spots in the tube, we'll see this sort of um, alternation between high and low pressure. Uh, and then in the middle, what's interesting is that they'll kind of balance each other out and you won't see much pressure change at all. Uh, we saw that in the Tacoma, Narrow, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, if you recall, um, the way the standing wave pattern got set up in that disaster. Um, okay, so, and what I was talking about with the slinky, uh, we can think about this like uh, with respect to our tube. Let's say we just put a, a microphone measuring air pressure at the far end of the tube, the closed end, uh, and we pushed a pressure pulse through it we'd see pressure increase until it reached some maximum. And then as that pressure pulse went away and the rarefaction came in to take its place, the pressure would decrease to some minimum. Uh, and then it would keep going back and forth that way, uh, but it would eventually peter out. Uh, the next pulse would not be as strong and the next minimum wouldn't be so um, deep, so on and so forth until it eventually just faded out like that. Um, yeah, eventually it'll go. So, uh, right. The reason why this is happening is just the outside world is absorbing some of the energy so it doesn't stay inside our sort of uh, tube system or our uh, slinky system. Or if you're pushing your uh, kid sister on a swing, like if you just push them once, it will just kind of go back and forth for a while and then eventually stop. And then uh, the playground won't be nearly so much fun anymore. Okay, so that's damping. <clears throat> and I can also make a distinction here between heavy damping and lightly, light damping. Uh, so if lots of energy gets lost to the externals of the system, uh, this waveform will peter out more quickly than if a little bit of energy is uh, lost to the system. So if this were, say, like a tighter coil uh, and wasn't quite as flexible, I'd lose that sort of back and forth vibration a lot more quickly. That would be heavy damping. This one's pretty flexible, so it's lightly damped. Um, Right, so the amount of damping we get in a tube is gonna be a function of, say, the volume of the tube, the surface area of the tube, and the material of which the tube is made. Um, and basically the idea is that um, the more volume and the more surface area you get, the more damping you're gonna get as well. And if the material is more of uh, like a spongy or a soft material as well, that'll absorb more energy from the sound wave too, so you'd get more damping in that um, situation as well. Uh, yeah, basically, like I said, uh, damping is just a function of energy getting lost to the system. So if it can kind of um, have more volume or more surface area to spread out into, you're going to lose more energy. Uh, and normally, uh, in class, I kind of walk everybody through this, but you can think about um, how different sort of uh, sound environments resonate around you in the world if we ever get back out there. Uh, so like if you go to a Home Depot, and I've heard that a lot of people are going to Home Depot because uh, they want to do like home improvement projects uh, while we're all stuck inside. But a Home Depot um, is kind of cavernous and there's lots of right angles and hard surfaces and whatnot, one of these gigantic new uh, modern um, hardware stores. And so when sound uh, is emitted from whatever source inside that sort of environment. It's gonna bounce around a lot and there's actually not much to kind of suck that energy out. Um, so it's actually not a great acoustic environment. Um, you uh, get, a lot, get a lot of sort of interference from other sounds coming um, throughout the entire store. And the same thing is true of like a, uh, a modern restaurant. Um, <clears throat> so rather than like an old style 
uh, diner like uh, Denny's or what have you. Uh, a lot of modern restaurants are, they don't have like any carpeting on the floor uh, and they have like an open kitchen. So you're getting a lot of noises coming out of that. Um, and uh, you know, there's some tinking of glasses and silverware and so on and so forth. There's not a lot of damping in the restaurant. I guess it looks cool or what have you, but it actually makes it harder to have a conversation. And who knows, maybe we can come up with a conspiracy theory that if you can't talk, then maybe they, uh, you might order more drinks or something like that and they make more money. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, a place that really is trying to um, sort of dampen out the sounds um, for your benefit as a customer is like a movie theater. Uh, and if you think about the way a movie theater look, uh, looks like, not only is there like all these cushioned seats and so on and so forth, but on the walls of the movie theater, they have like these curtains with these little crenellations in them, these little folds, which actually um, give you more surface area in which the sound can kind of get trapped. Um, so that uh, when sound comes out of uh, the loudspeakers from the movie soundtrack itself, it's not bouncing around in the movie theater a lot um, and kind of interfering with um, sounds that are supposed to happen in the next scene or what have you. Um, you get a nice clear signal from um, the soundtrack itself without the room kind of getting in the way. And a really extreme example of that, of that sort of uh, damping environment is an anechoic chamber. Um, so this is a picture of what one looks like. So uh, if you are, this is a person recording some sound in an anechoic chamber, uh, and the idea here is that there are these wedges on all the walls of the anechoic chamber, even the ceiling, uh, such that um, these are kind of a softer material, uh, and they create a lot of surface area and volume in little nooks and crannies in which the sound from the middle of the room can get kind of stuck, so it's not bouncing back and forth and resonating and give you sort of giving you sort of the formance of the room rather than the formance of, um, say, the speaker's voice. Uh, and usually, like I, like I said, the these are made of kind of a softer material so that uh, they can absorb some energy that way too. Uh, yeah, so why am I talking about all this? Uh, we get damping in nasals because our uh, nasal cavities function a little bit like, say, the curtains in a movie theater or these wedges on the side of an anechoic chamber. Um, and they will suck some energy out of the airflow through your nose and create damping in the output acoustic signal that we see in a spectrogram. Um, so I've got uh, sort of a slice of what the inside of your nose looks like. I think this is looking at um, one of these uh, sections. Um, so the idea is that this is, these are the two passageways through your nose. Uh, and you might notice that there's a lot of kind of nooks and crannies in here, and this is usually softer material uh, that's kind of like um, filled with liquid, so on and so forth. So as air passes through it, the biological function is that um, the air is supposed to uh, get a bit warmer and more humidified before it goes into your lungs, which is nice in an environment like Calgary where things are often cold and dry. Uh, but the um, linguistic implications of this is that uh, the air might get stuck in these nooks and crannies as it goes through your nose and it's not going to be as energetic by the time it gets out into the outside world. Uh, we're going to get a lot of damping in the signal effectively. Um, so that's going to decrease the amplitude of uh, the nasal airflow and it's also going to spread the energy that you do see. Like I said, if you just mm, produce a nasal like that, um, it's going to basically be a vowel through your nose, but the vowel formants, the nasal vowel formants, the nasal formants rather, are gonna have wider bandwidth than we normally see in regular vowels that are produced um, orally or even nasalized vowels for that matter. Um, so this is uh, what, this is a production of Ma. This is from a Mandarin speaker. Ma. Um, so this gives you uh, what the ah looks like here. This is sort of a regular vowel. And then um, this is what the nasal looks like. Again, it's kind of vocalic, uh, at least in appearance, uh, but it maybe kind of looks like a ghost of a vowel, you might say. And again, it has a low frequency first formant and these higher formants are weaker in intensity. This F3 is kind of standing out pretty nicely in this one, which is why I picked it. Um, so this helps you kind of make a contrast here. Here's our F3 for ah, and the bandwidth is basically this region or range of frequencies from top to bottom that are standing out for the formant. Ma. And that is narrower in the vowel than it is in the nasal itself. It gets kind of smeared here. So the top, it's the whole formant kind of gets smushed down. You smush down the intensity and it gets broadened in terms of its frequency range. 
Um, and it's not super easy to say, well, I know this is an M rather than some other kind of nasal, but it's pretty easy to say, well, this is a nasal and this is a vowel because I get this um, overall faded out pattern here. And I also get this nice clear break in between the nasal and the vowel itself, right? So we're producing a nasal by opening up, opening up that velar pharyngeal port and we stop making the nasal by closing it. So there's a really nice um, sort of um, qualitative distinction between those two types of airflow. And we can see that clearly uh, where we make that change in the spectrographic, uh, spectrographic record itself. Okay, so you should be able to spot these um, when we do look at spectrograms. That's what you can look for. I'll give you one last little random fact about nasals, which is kind of fun. Um, talking about opening and closing that velopharyngeal port with your soft palate, um, you can release an oral stop closure, like say a D, um, not by the usual route of just release or lowering your tongue so you get that alveolar release burst like a duh. Um, you can actually release it by opening up that velopharyngeal port so that air starts flowing through your nose. You can go straight from uh, oral stop to a nasal stop without having any sort of vowel in between. Um, when you do this, it's called nasal plosion. Um, and uh, there's the way you can represent it in the IPA is with like a superscripted nasal stop. So a D with a superscripted nasal right next to it. Um, I've got some examples here of uh, Peter Latifoga trying to demonstrate this phenomenon with these various English words. So again, we have like a D here, uh, which as a Canadian speaker of English, you might say with like a flap rather than a true D, he's gonna say them with a genuine alveolar stop. And then there's a nasal alveolar stop right after them. Maybe there would be, might be a schwa in between the two, maybe there won't. If there is not a schwa, then he's gonna produce them with nasal plosion. Um, so I'll play you the schwa examples first. Hidden, sadden, sadden, leaden. And you can hear he's kind of siddon, uh, trying to get that vowel in there. And here it is with nasal plosion. Hidden, sadden, sudden, leaden. Sudden. So yeah, just going straight from the D to the end, a D to the N at the end. Uh, my uh, wife is a speaker of nasal, uh, my wife is a speaker of nasal, she's a speaker of Russian, uh, among other things, and um, Russian is a language that has nasal plosion in initial position, which might be a little bit trickier for you to um, get the handle, get a handle on, but uh, as a speaker yourself, uh, but we see this in words like bottom, dn, o, and of the day, DNA, I'm not gonna try this uh, and I'll let my wife, the expert, do it instead. Uh, but she's gonna go straight from the D to the N here without any vowel in between. Dno. Dna. Like that one, play one more time. Dno. Dna. So you can still hear that uh, sort of release burst of the uh, oral stop. It's just a burst happening because of the opening of the velopharyngeal port, uh, which is kind of fun. I will also give you these notes about the perception of nasals. Uh, like I said, uh, the sort of internal acoustic cues to nasals don't provide you which, with much help in terms of identifying their place of articulation. If you just look at one nasal um, in a spectrogram, it looks a lot like any other. Um, there's a subtle cue you might be able to latch onto, but I'll save that for 441 if you want to take advanced phonetics uh, in the fall. Um, so. Uh, the other, there, well, the one I will mention actually it, that you might be able to pick up on is that uh, you should be able to see some uh, transition cues for nasals as well. So this is very subtle and you might be able to catch, uh, pick up on it when you're looking at a spectrogram, you might not, but this is a bilabial. So we should see F2 going down into it and, and it kind of does a little bit, right? So the transition cues might help you out. The internal cues uh, are not that great. So. Um, this murmur mm, versus mm, is going to sound a lot like all the other different nasal places of articulation. And so I usually do this experiment in class. Uh, I'll do it for you guys here, or you can do it at home. And I just play through these three different nasal murmurs and have people uh, try to identify if they're M, N, or Engma. Uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, these are all Peter Latifoged producing these segments. I'll play them again. Um, and I usually have people just raise their hands as they're doing it. Uh, again, you might find this easier if you do it at home. Uh, but the first one of these is alveolar. Second is bilabial. So that's an M. 
and this is the angma. Uh, so that's hard to do. <clears throat> There's a um, study from a while back. Uh, Bruno Rep tried this in the lab and found that people can only distinguish between uh, these first two and an M 72% of the time. But you get more help if you get those transition cues. Um, so if you can get some sense of what the vowel is doing right before it goes into or out of the nasal, um, that helps a lot. So, or it should. Uh, so this is uh, kind of another replication of the other half of that rep study where he found that 95% of the nasals are identified correctly when presented with the first 10 milliseconds of the following vowel. Um, so if you get the nasal murmur and then a little bit of a vowel after it, like ma, ma, uh, or na, or na, um, then we'll see how you do. So uh, these are the nasal murmurs in just 10 milliseconds of the following vowel, or you can consider it the transition, the vowel transition as well. Uh, I'll play them a couple times. You can tell me what you think they are. Maybe I'm not going to do it that way. Uh, one more time. So uh, maybe you picked up on that, but the first one of those is the velar engma. Na. This is an alveolar na. And this is a bilabial. Uh, so that makes your job a lot easier. So if you are uh, faced with the task of trying to identify these in a uh, spectrogram, you might want to look for those transition cues uh, and not worry too much about what's happening in the middle. But this should give you a nice, clear, strong cue that this is a nasal as opposed to something else. What that something else is most likely to be is something we'll talk about in the last lecture, which is going to be the last lecture um, per se for the semester. So uh, we're almost there. Okay, um, see you then.